200 years ago, Dutch and British sailors took to the sea and discovered the world. They discovered the Orient and it made them rich. From these legendary eastern lands, they brought rare spices as yet unknown to our western palates. Cloves and cinnamon, pepper and nutmeg, flavors which were to give a new life to the monotonous foods of Europe. And it was here, in this land of China, ancient Cathay, they discovered the herb which was to become the homely comfort of our life. They discovered tea. China was the original home of the tea drinker. For nearly 2,000 years, the Chinese have sipped tea from the exquisite porcelain cups of their Cathay dynasties. Tea was the drink of their poets and sages. It became one of the subtle flavors in their philosophy and in the personality of their civilization. It was known both to emperor and to peasant. The knowledge of this comfortable herb was first brought west on the tongues of travelers. Then, at the time of Queen Elizabeth, the leaf itself began to filter into Europe. The first caskets of tea that were broached in Britain revealed something that was treated as a rare and mysterious substance. Its flavor was the exclusive pleasure of queens and gentlefolk who locked the leaves away and guarded them in jeweled caskets as though they were the very ashes of ambrosia. Not everyone who got it knew what to do with it. When the Duchess of Monmouth sent a packet of tea to friends in Scotland, they boiled the leaves as though they were stewing cabbage. But the tea drinking habit spread swiftly through the country as the subtle charms of the beverage filtered into its imagination and way of life. Tea loosened the tongue and lightened the bonds of friendship. Inside the famous coffee houses of London, tea began to take its place with chocolate, coffee and sherbet. Extravagant broadsheets were printed in its honor. The virtues of this tea be strange and many. It purifies the blood of that which is gross and heavy. It vanquishes heavy dreams. It drieth moist humors in the head. The demand for tea grew, and by the early 19th century, its use had spread even to the rural districts of Britain. But it was still expensive and heavily taxed, and together with wines, silks, and other treasures, great quantities were brought into Britain by the smugglers along our coasts. At this time, all tea still came from China in sailing ships. Leaving Canton together on the same tide, nothing more would be heard of them until they arrived off Land's End some hundred days later. But China was a long way off, and the monopoly of the East India Company kept supplies short and prices high. A source of tea nearer at home was needed, and India was the answer. In 1823, Major Bruce, a British explorer, returned from Assam. He reported having found a wild tree growing in the jungle. Its leaves contained strange aromatic properties. It was tea. of wild tea trees growing in the Assam jungles was to change the whole balance of the trade. In 1833, the monopoly of the East India Company was dissolved. Now, production in India could begin. When the first planters went up into Assam, this is the country they found. A hot green jungle of grass and forest, poisoned by swamps and cut up by gleaming rivers. In the forests there were monkeys, snakes, leopards and tigers, disease and death. But in the forests too, there was tea.
was a hard life and a tough job. It meant taming a wild, inaccessible country and altering the face of a landscape. At first, the planters lived in rough bamboo shelters by the river bank. Later, they built themselves houses and communities in the jungle. The native Assamese were their first laborers. And later, they made friends with the short, proud, naked Nagas, the headhunters from the hills who brought them wild tea bushes in exchange for salt or silver or strings of scarlet beads. making the first plantations began. First, the jungle had to be cleared. Trees hacked down, undergrowth cut and burnt. The earth had to be scorched and purged of its old wildlife and prepared for its cultivation by man. After the clearings, they made the roads. Roads to lay the jungle open to the river, for the rivers were their only lines of communication with the outside world. Up them would come their machinery and supplies. Down them, one day, they would float the tea from their gardens. But that was only the beginning. Planting tea in this kind of country brought its own problems. Success from failure was the order of those days, for none yet knew the best ways of cultivation, nor what kind of tea plants would flourish best. The plants were put in, and they died. Or the rain tore them out again, or the winds broke them, or the soil was washed away. But out of these setbacks, the way was found. Assam today is the largest tea growing district in the world. Its annual export is nearly 300 million pounds, more than half of India's total and a quarter of the world's. To serve this enormous industry, workers migrate from many parts of India, from Bengal and Madras, Bihar and the United Provinces, Buryas from Orissa and Mundas from Chota Nagpur. Tea planting in India began in Assam, but soon gardens began to spring up elsewhere, on the Nilgiri hills in the south, and to the north on the fresh slopes of Darjeeling and in the Duars, wherever the soil and climate was favourable. From India it spread to Ceylon and to Java and Sumatra, and in the present century to British Africa, to Nyasaland, Kenya, Uganda and Tanganyika. After planting begins the infinite labour of cultivation to force from these bushes their best flush of leaf. Untended, they would grow rank again and wild. So the soil must be built up and fertilised, hoed and weeded. Next, the bushes must be cut back and cut back again and carefully pruned so that they will grow squat and rich and multiply their leaves. Until in the hot, moist air their many twigs put out their tender shoots the two leaves and a bud that form their harvest. Under a canopy of shade trees, the women work their way steadily across the garden. Like dark moths, their hands quiver over the bushes. Towards this flush of harvest, that the long, careful years of cultivation have been directed, and the plucking of the leaf is the climax of these operations. At the end of the day, the leaf is carried down to the factory. 
on the heads of the women in ox carts, lorries or miniature railways, it is brought in to be checked and weighed. freshly plucked leaf is carried into the leaf house where expert hands spread it lightly upon open air shelves. Here it stays until it begins to wither. Inside the factory the withered leaf, now soft as a kid glove, is poured into machines and rolled and crushed until the skin breaks and the fine interior juices start to move. Next, the rolled leaf is sifted to break up the sticky balls and make the leaf fit for spreading. But already the bruised leaf, helped by contact with the air, is beginning to turn a bright coppery brown. After this, all moisture must be driven from the leaf by bursts of hot air generated by a firing machine. It comes out black and dry, the crisp familiar tea leaf, waiting only the housewife's boiling kettle to release its rich aroma. London Export Trade, demanding all... Amsterdam auction opens first. North Africa sends orders for tippies. USA wants the best leaf. Australia calling for jar. Canada awaiting new season. All markets calling for Darjeeling's, SM, Milgaris. The world wants tea. Salons, the world wants tea. Jarvis, Africa's, the world wants tea. Orders, orders. Voices calling for tea. It is packed into goods trucks. It floats down the river. It rolls along the yellow roads. The tea is on its way. From the far gardens of Assam and Arjeeling, from the green slopes of the Nilgiri Hills, the tea is coming. It is coming also from the hills of Ceylon and from the distant estates of Java and Sumatra and from Africa, to the ports of Chittagong and Cochin, Colombo and Surabaya, Mombasa, Bara and Calcutta. Chests of tea which will be shipped and blended for all the world. In Calcutta, the Indian crop is divided for sale. Some will be bought for consumption in India. Some will be bought for overseas markets, the United States or Canada, Africa, Australia and New Zealand. But the bulk of the crop will go to Britain, the biggest tea importing country in the world. The tea has come to London. In a thousand chests it looks alike. But here is tea from all the gardens of the East. Tea of all kinds and qualities and grades. And as a coin is rung for its value, so now the experts will test the value of these teas by their flavours. The special equipment of the tea taster is his pellet. With this he assesses the price and grade of every shipment. The tea taster lives in a world of taste and aroma, and he speaks a language of his own. Leaf, flat, well made, with a good show of bright golden tip in the broken orange peco. Yes, Nickers. They taste very nice and brisk. I think I'd call them pungent. Good pungency in flavour, with useful strength and cup. 
Yes, you choose them. Yeah, fully up to the standard of the mark. These teas of various qualities and flavours are like the primary colours of an artist's paint box. They must be mixed to produce the best effects. They must be blended one with another to produce the flavours the housewife prefers and knows. At long last, the tea leaf begins to assume its familiar dress. This is the tea of India and Ceylon, of Java, Sumatra and British Africa. Only a few hundred years ago, there was no tea outside China. It was unknown, untasted and unimagined. Now listen. Well, I think I'll make the tea now. You feel better after a cup of tea? Do you take milk? I really don't mind, just as it comes. Do you take sugar? Well, if you can spare it. One or two lumps? One will do, thanks. Your tea? As wine is to the French, as coffee to the Brazilians, as coconut milk to the South Sea Islander, so is tea our national drink. But more than a drink, it is an institution. It has added a new meal to the day. Tea is a ritual and a social grace. Drunken with others, it becomes the lubrication of friendliness. Alone, it is the comfortable distillation of one's private thoughts. That is tea's story. And this bush is the source of it. And a hundred million people each day know the flavor of its leaf.